Incredible ocean, magical place to be. So much that we can learn from life in the deep blue sea. Incredible ocean, magical place to be. So much that we can learn from life in the deep blue sea. Hello! <laughs> Welcome to Incredible Oceans TV! Star Wars slash Starfish special. Oh, oh, Anyone oh, oh, that oh, oh, oh. isn't a Star Wars fan. <laughs> You got anything to say about Star Wars there, Russell? <laughs> oh, I'm oh, unmuting. Oh. <laughs> I can't hear you. Oh, I think you need my help there, Russell. Here we go. Oh, you're still muted. Mute. Oh, there we go. You're back. <laughs> welcome back. I'm back. There we go. Slightly awkward, but there we go. Hi, welcome to... <laughs> Star Wars version of Incredible Oceans TV. Basically, I'm a big Star Wars nerd and I forced the other guys to do this. I was like, come on, <laughs> we're totally going to do some tenuous underwater um, ocean thing. So as you can see, we've got Princess Leia and Jabba the Hutt and oh, I oh, didn't oh, have oh, anything oh. to wear. So I'm letting the side down. Massively. What can I say? <laughs> what can I say? What can I say? <laughs> anyway, I think we might have the news now we do have the news ocean now you're quite news. right Let's see the ocean news <laughs> i think it might be ocean currents i got my star wars toys out <laughs> thank you Local residents of Muzzleborough in Scotland reported this sad sight of thousands of dead starfish whilst walking during their daily exercise. One theory for this tragedy is the strong cold winds over shallow waters. The combination can be rough on the starfish residents, clinging to rocks and sandy bottoms. The conditions can dislodge the echinoderms, that's the scientific name for starfish. Another theory could be that they were starballing which allows them to move quickly with the currents, but that conditions were too wild for them to control where they ended up. Sad as it is to see all these dead starfish, it is a stark reminder that life in the ocean can be a tough place to survive, no matter how many hands you have to hold on with. Now, it's ocean currents, again, that are likely responsible for huge amounts of microplastics collecting on the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea off the coast of Italy. These tiny fragments of plastic, less than one millimetre, are being transported to particular locations by underwater avalanches and deep water currents. Sadly, these locations are where there's lots of life, so the tiny plastic is likely to end up as food for the creatures living there. Later on in the programme, I will be talking about how plastics we have here on land ends up in the ocean and in these hot spots and what we can do to stop that. That's all from me. Thank you for listening. This has been Abigail Kidd reporting for the Incredible Oceans News. Echinoderms. Echinoderms. That... Echinoderms. Okay. Okay, no dumps. <laughs> the kind of dumps. You got that. You got that. Great stuff. Okay, right. <laughs> so, my, I was like, what can I do to tenuously link 
Oceans and Star Wars. So what I thought I'd try and do is go through and see which nerdy marine biologists had really, really enjoyed Star Wars. And so when they discovered a new creature, I thought, you know, they discovered this new creature, so they're going to name it something to do with Star Wars. So this, I went through, and it took me quite a while to find all the weird marine animals that had Star Wars names. But I put together <laughs> this little video of the best of the marine creatures that are Star Wars themed. And it's not like it looks a little bit like this, but they've actually got official scientific names that are Star Wars themed. So here's the little video. Hope you enjoy it. So we're going to start off in the Cambrian period, which is about 500 million years ago. Life only just started and this creature evolved and it happened to be one of the apex predators of the time. When scientists discovered this fossil, they thought, you know what, this looks remarkably like the Millennium Falcon. So why don't we call it something along those lines? So this is actually called Cambrorasta falcatus. And this, or even though it's about a foot long, about 30 centimetres long, this was one of the apex predators of the Cambrian period because life hadn't evolved yet into these kind of much bigger animals. So moving on, we're going to look at another fossil, this one of a trilobite. Now trilobites are a group of life forms that used to live on Earth, unfortunately they went extinct at the end of the Permian mass extinction, but these things were the dominant life form on Earth for about 300 million years. To give you a comparison, humans have been on Earth for about 20,000 years. So these things completely nailed it. So this particular fossil was found in southern China and they decided to name it after the Han Chinese. It was also the only one of this genus that they found. So obviously they had to call it Solo. So this one is actually called Han Solo. Where did you dig up that old fossil? So moving on, we have this species of armored catfish that was discovered in Brazil in 1998. Researchers didn't get around to naming it until the mid 2000s. When they were there trying to figure out a name for it, one of the guys came into their lab and went, Hey, it kind of looks like one of the guys from Star Wars. They weren't sure which one, so they went back through, they watched Star Wars again. And it turns out the guy he was talking about was Greedo. So they named this species of fish after Greedo. <coughs> so moving from rivers down into the deep ocean floor, we encounter a group of animals called the acorn worms. And these burrow into deep ocean sediments. This particular one was found in between Iceland and the Azores on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. It's this bright, vivid purple colour because it's full of iodine compounds. When scientists found this species with those kind of side appendages, they went, this totally looks like Yoda. So they called this Yoda purpurata, which means purple Yoda. Now Yoda's actually got another marine species named after him, a type of parasitic isopod that lives inside the gills of crabs around Taiwan. Nice. Mm, parasite I am! Out of all of the Star Wars marine creatures that we've been talking about, this next one is my absolute favourite. It's a deep ocean worm called Osidax. Now Osidax relies really really heavily on something called a whale fall. Now whale fall kind of does what it says on the tin, and it's when a whale dies in the upper ocean, sinks down through the water column until it lands on the sea floor. In come all these scavengers and really quickly strip all the flesh and the blubber off it until just the skeleton remains. Now in 2002, scientists from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute discovered a whale fall, and they found that all over the bones was this red fuzz. They took a sample of the red fuzz and it happened to be thousands and thousands of tiny worms that had burrowed into the bones themselves. So it gets even weirder because Osidax has no stomach and it has no mouth. So instead, it's got a symbiotic relationship with some bacteria that help it digest and absorb the lipids and the fats and the proteins that are found inside the whale's skeleton. But how does it burrow down into the skeleton without a mouth? It secretes acid. Now there's lots of different species of Osidax worm, 
but one in particular has got a tail like one of the characters in Return of the Jedi, which gives this animal the name Osidax Jabba. Oh, 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 oh. So when it comes to exploring our ocean, it's the largest habitat we have on Earth and we've only explored 5% of it. On average, we're discovering a new animal once every two weeks. So imagine that you found a brand new creature that no one has seen before. What sci-fi film would you name it after? Happy Star Wars Day. Got to say my favourite one was absolutely the Jabberworm. <laughs> How long have you been waiting for something like that, Russell? So I know technically it's not Star Wars Day anymore because that was on May the 4th. May the 4th be with you. And as this is the 6th of May, technically this is like Revenge of the 6th. See what we did there? <laughs> yeah. What I'm really talking really about is that we managed, you know, I've been lugging these Star Wars figures around for 40 years. These are my, these are my toys, my actual toys that I had when I was a kid. And I remember my mum saying to me, throw, get rid of them, sell them to two. <laughs> Two P or whatever, and I kept hold of them. And now my Star Wars collection is actually the most valuable thing I own, which is Wait, really nuts. Uh, I've got, I don't know how I many, I've, I've got rid of lots of them. You can see there, I've got, oh, there we go. Uh, over there, I've got all these beasts. I've got that ATAT, -AT, that thing there, the ATAT. I got, actually got that for my 25th <laughs> birthday. That's how much of a nerd I am. There we go. But yeah, so it's cool. Actually, like, and now I'm really pleased. Is don't throw away your toys. What's what? Or your plastic toys. Is don't throw away your toys. Or your plastic yeah. toys. Exactly. Hang on to your Especially toys. Because the ocean. randomly, they might be worth some money <laughs> one day. Not yeah, don't throw your toys into the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually have. Uh, right, I what have we got next marine, then? We have got. It's a marine biology Star Wars. The War of the, the Sea Stars Ooh. and the Starfish. Here we go. Ooh. Technically, I am not a fish. Call me a sea star. No, no, never. Wow. We're not. Well, that was that was a delight. <laughs> <laughs> so we do also have. Um, if you liked that, if you enjoyed that bit of starfish, sea stars, or even I nearly fell into it. Then there's even more sea stars to come. Are you guys ready? Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Today we are going to be learning about sea stars. Now sea stars come in all shapes and sizes from the tiny 5mm long paddle spine sea star all the way up to the 3 feet long sunflower sea star. Now this star is a voracious predator and the largest sea star in the world. So as well as having a huge appetite it also uses its mouth in a special way in that it can extend its stomach outside of its body to digest the prey it hunts for, which is amazing. Now, sea stars 
have seawater instead of blood and they take in that seawater through a special pore called a madreporite. And once inside, they not only use it for circulation, but for locomotion. So they can pump it into their tube feet, which you can see here beneath their arms. Now, these tube feet not only help the sea stars walk, but they also grip onto things with suckered ends. So they can use it to pull apart the shells of prey or to climb and cling to different surfaces, which also helps them avoid predators. So you can see this in action here, each one of those tube feet moving independently to help that sea star walk across the glass. Isn't that amazing? Now if a sea star does encounter a predator like this crab, don't fear, they can lose up to three quarters of their body and they can regrow their arms as you can see here, no problem. And if an arm is detached from a sea star and retains enough of the central body, it can actually develop into a completely new sea star. Isn't that amazing? Now, this is sometimes called the feathered starfish, but it is not a sea star. It's actually something called a crinoid, whereas sea stars are echinoderms, but they are beautiful. So, what is a sea star? Let's have a look at some of them. But none of these are the sea star we're going to be looking at today. That's right, we have a celebrity sea star here, the pink short spine star made famous by Spongebob. Now to make your very own Patrick, first of all you want to start by very carefully cutting out the shape of your sea star. Now don't be afraid to ask for help if you're not sure on how to do this safely, because sometimes we all need a helping hand. Now, once you've done that, we're going to start looking at the anatomy of our sea star. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to paint its shell that lovely pink. And I made my pink by mixing a darker fuchsia with some white. Now, once that's dried nicely, paint the other side and then we can start painting the spines on. Now, that central circle is where you'd find that madreporite and also your sea star's anus. So once you've painted on all of your spines and it's dried, we're going to turn your sea star over. We're going to paint the ambulacral grooves. Now these are where you'd find those tube feet. And these are connected up to that madreporite by something called a radial canal. Now we're going to just paint on these lovely tube feet and suckers using white so that you can see them clearly. Sometimes I might draw a line, but most of the time I'm just going to do a great big spot of paint so it's a little bit 3D. And once you've done that and let your new friend dry, it's ready to join our macaroni penguin in your ocean biome. There we go. Fantastic. There you go. <laughs> oh, amazing. I love that. <laughs> oh, I think the sun one is my favorite, that species. They're just gigantic. They're huge. They are huge. And you know, I actually thought they were the fastest, but there's actually another species that can go even faster. One of the hard, spiny ones. Oh, oh okay. interesting. Lovely. Well, last week we were obviously in, I was in the Antarctic. And um, with the penguins. <laughs> <Travel far. laughs> um, and even though I believe starfish can be found in sort of all marine or oceans, um, I sort of wanted um, just to sort of show the importance of protecting our oceans sort of, it's closer than we think. Um, so, yes. So here we go with conservation matters. <laughs> <laughs>
any natural or wild space will be brimming with wildlife from tiny little insects to foxes and rabbits. This is one of my favourite locations for watching wildlife. It's in a woodland just behind where I live. I thought that I would come down here today to check up the stream and um, have a little look and share what I find. But not a lot is actually going on and I think I might know why. I think it's very easy to think small, but when we think big, we realise that these small pieces of litter not only have the potential to harm local wildlife here, but wildlife and the ecosystems of our oceans, so it matters. And it can be overwhelming, but there are actually four ways which can help us to manage our waste. Reuse. Instead of throwing items away, you or someone you know can reuse materials in their original form. Reduce. Use natural resources wisely, using only what you absolutely need to avoid waste. Refuse. Do not buy unnecessary things or products that are or come in single-use packaging. Say no. Recycle. Have your own recycling mission. Don't throw away anything that could be recycled. I found these really helpful guides for managing my own rubbish and if you get stuck, I hope they do too. That was absolutely lovely, Abby. So that's just right by your home, that lovely stream. Yeah, just um, outside, like about like two minutes away. So as part of my sort of allotted time I'm allowed outside, um, I went around there and I was there for like the whole hour waiting for some wildlife. And um, there were rabbits, which was lovely, but further down, so in the, in the river Usk, there are, I didn't realize this, but you find, you can find wild salmon, trout, otters, um, although there's been a huge decline in all of those. Um, from what I understand, there are organizations that are working to sort of understand that a bit better. But um, the people that I've spoken to are just, they just say they're so overwhelmed and can't believe mm. the amount of rubbish that is still, even like now, you know, we're more conscious of it. Um, so, and yeah, but there's a, one of the good things about social media is you can sort of flick through, and you've probably seen this, people get really creative on how to reuse <laughs> items. And I, I was watching this video on YouTube for like, it was about eight minutes long, and it was how to reuse cardboard toilet rolls, the, the carbon did. Oh. So fascinating. There's like a thousand like alternative things you can use rather than just sort of throwing it away. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. So we, maybe we could do a little bit like at some point of how to reuse some of the recycling even more. That would be I think really so. Cool. I think that would be really cool. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Did You oh, you did a big litter pick as well, didn't you? Yeah. So I know that um, <laughs> it's probably not, not best for us to be advising people to do litter picks, but um, most of us probably do that in our own time. 
Mm. Um, but I, um, yeah, I did. I couldn't help myself. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> to picking up rubbish. <laughs> yeah, I know the feeling. Uh, yeah, oh. but obviously wearing my gloves and I have a little yeah. pickup. Perfect. Right, well, I think it's about time for Russell to do his amazing live experiment for us. So I'm going to bring you off and bring him on in the hope that the uh, delay for him will be reduced and his computer will be back in action. I'll see you very soon. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Russell. So it might take a moment for you to unmute. I think you're still muted. Can I unmute you? No, you might have to unmute yourself. Hey, hello. My oh, computer there you is go. really struggling today. I clearly everyone in my house is watching something or downloading something. Anyway, <laughs> what I've got today is a really, really tenuous Star Wars experiment that you can do at home. So I was trying Perfect. to think of like a home experiment that was Star Wars themed that also had something to do with the ocean. So what I thought I came up with, I was like, okay, what do all uh, Jedi's have a lightsaber what powers that lightsaber i know mm. a kyber crystal so we're going to have a go a at making our own kyber crystals although they're not kyber crystals because kyber doesn't unfortunately exist we're going to make a sodium chloride crystal there we go incredible so, well i'm going to leave you to do that russell i believe in you. you this is going to be incredible <laughs> i hope so let's see what happens let's see what happens so the sea is salty. If you've ever been in the sea, you know it's salty. And this is sea salt. This is just salt that you would buy in a supermarket. It's not very exciting, but it does make our food sometimes taste a little bit better. Now, this, the proper chemical name for it is sodium chloride. And that's because it's a salt molecule is made from one part sodium, one part chlorine. Now, when you mix it in the water, what happens is really briefly, those sodium and that chlorine attach to the water molecule and they dissolve. So it looks like it's disappeared, but it hasn't quite, it's dissolved. And if we let all that water evaporate away, the salt would be left at the bottom. Now, what we're gonna try and do is we wanna make bigger crystals. We don't want these little poxy little ones that come from a supermarket that have been ground up so they go into our food faster. We want some really, really big crystals. And for that, what we need to do is to make something called a super saturated solution. So what we basically need to do is put so much salt into the water that it just can't take any more salt. And at that point, it's called super saturated. So what I've got here is cold water. And you'll notice as I'm putting more and more and more salt in there, eventually it reaches a point where no more salt that can dissolve. And I end up with a little bit of salt at the bottom. But now the thing is, we want to speed up a chemical reaction. We want to speed up how quickly or how much salt can be absorbed we can use hot water. So this is hot water and you can see there some that my glass is all steamed up and I've got a little bit of steam coming off the top of it. So what you need is hot water. And if you, the hotter the water, the better. So you might wanna get a grown up to help you do this. I'm gonna keep adding and keep stirring and keep adding and keep stirring until my water can't take any more salt. And at that point, once it can't take any more salt, I'll know my, my solution is super saturated. Then what you've got to do with your super saturated solution, look, it's pretty much all gone. I'm going to just keep, I'm going to add another one. Super saturated solution is actually quite difficult to say, I've realized. So super saturated solution, once you've got it, then what you need to do is find something to let the crystals grow on. Now, crystals like growing on rough surfaces. So the easiest way to do that is to get a stick or to get a piece of string and then dangle it, get a spoon across the top and then dangle it in the water. And as soon as the salt crystals detect that rough surface, they'll start sticking to the edge of it. And what you wanna do is you wanna leave your salt solution with the string or the stick dangling in it for a long time. So what I've done, I say a long time. So this one I've done for about three days. So I got a closed peg across the top there. 
I got my stick was a uh, a cocktail stick skewer thing that I snapped in half, and this was my uh, salt solution. And you can see here that I'm growing my own really, really big salt crystals on there. Now, what you've got to do is a little bit of maintenance. You kind of got to leave it, and the longer you leave it, and the calmer and the slower the water is evaporating, then the bigger your crystals will become. Uh, and if you get any crystals growing on the edge or on the bottom, you need to take those crystals out. So I did that this morning. So I'm hoping that my crystals over by the time next week will be even bigger. Now, white crystals are pretty cool, but if we wanna make our lightsabers different colors, you need different color kyber crystals. So I did an experiment to see whether salt crystals could take up some food coloring. So I here's some I made with by adding some blue food coloring to it. And then I had a go at making my own, hopefully, blue colored kyber crystals. So here we are. These are the blue ones which I've managed to make. Now the cool thing about this experiment is I've done it with salt because the sea is salty and I wanted to kind of have an ocean thing going. But you can basically do this with anything that dissolves in water. So you can do this with sugar as well and you can make kind of those sugar stirrer things that you sometimes get in posh coffee shops. But you can also do it with different types of salt. So if you've got someone in your family that's on a low sodium diet and you're buying low salt, that isn't sodium chloride, that's potassium chloride. And you'll get a completely different type of crystal because it's a completely different type of element as well. So you can try different dissolving different types of things. You can try adding different colors and see how awesome crystals you can make. There we go. And what I'd love to do, if you do happen to make a really awesome crystal, please take photographs. I want to see your working process. I want to see people having a go at doing this experiment at home. Send in, like email us your awesome pictures of crystals. And I would love to show them on the show next week as or however long it takes for your crystals to grow. Like I said, slower is better. Anyway, that is your experiment. Hopefully everyone will be able to try this out at home. And I think now we've got a little bit of a Q&A. So thank you for watching Incredible Oceans TV episode three. And I hopefully Abby and Annette will come back now and we can see what random questions people have asked us this week. Yeah, Russell, that was wonderful. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. Also, you made a really important point, which is we want to see the things that you guys are making. So please send them in. Whatever it is, we're a sea creature or a crystal. We want to see it. Send it in, please, and we can show it on the show next week. We would love that. Actually, Thank you. I did. I forgot. So someone that was watching last week sent us a lovely image of a mm -hmm. lettuce that oh. they have been regrowing. So rather than throwing it away, let me see if I can find it. These guys. <laughs> so they've oh, chopped wow. them down. The one on the right is only a week old. Wow, and they're just they're just growing that in water. Yeah, so they basically just cut a little cross into the bottom of their lettuce, put it in about a centimeter of water, and they start growing. And I've been doing um doing it with mine and it has already started to grow. So I'll take a photo of it. For, uh, for next week's. But it would be so cool to see what, yeah, what people are doing. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, well, thank you so I, I much, grew, lovely human. I grew the top of a carrot this week. That's oh, this is, this is lockdown for you. <laughs> uh, it's like the highlight of my week. I grew a carrot and some crystals. So we do actually have a it's question a about week. crystals. So thank you everyone for their comments so far. We really, really appreciate it. And Russell, this one's directed at you. So it's a How question. Long? How long can you grow the crystals for? So what you need to do with growing the crystals is what happens if a crystal, if there's any dirt or anything in the jar, then the crystals will start sticking to the dirt. And if there's dirt in the water, then what happens is the crystal sticks to the dirt, grows into a crystal, and then it gets pulls in the other kind of salt particles and eventually it gets so big that it ends up coming out of solution and sinks to the bottom. So what you need to be able to do 
is keep it really, really clean. And if you're getting uh, salt crystals forming on the top or on the bottom, then you need to kind of take your, your stick out really carefully, pour your salt solution uh, into another thing, clean out all the crystals and then put them back in. Because the only place you want crystals to form is on the stick. So, like I said, so I've got some quite good ones at the top there from where that's where the water was. But, um, yeah, I've also got these ones at the end there. Oh, and the cool thing about salt crystals is if you form them really, really slowly, they form perfect cubes, which is pretty cool because of the way, because of the, way the uh, molecules interact, which is pretty awesome. So, yeah, totally, let's get going on uh, weird salt crystal making. <laughs> sure. So we have another question about salt as well. So Ooh. do warmer seas carry more dissolved salt and does that make them more acidic? Okay, interesting. So warmer seas do hold uh, more salt. Uh, so Mediterranean is really, really salty. And that's also partly because it's got quite limited rivers flowing into it and only a little place where it can mix with the rest of the ocean. So the, the Mediterranean is much saltier and so is the Red Sea. Uh, so it's gonna be quite tricky. It's quite difficult when you're an oceanographer out there because you've got to make sure that all of your equipment is made of really, really high grade steel. Otherwise the additional temperature and the additional salt make everything corrode much, much faster. Mm -hmm. As for it making it more acidic, salt, uh, the extra salt and things in the ocean actually make the ocean a higher pH. So the ocean is actually marginally alkali. It's about 7.7, .7, I believe. But it, the things that are making it more acidic is the extra carbon dioxide that we're putting up into the atmosphere, which is then getting absorbed by the ocean and is causing uh, ocean acidification. There we go. Fantastically answered, Russell. I hope that was exactly what you wanted, Rhett. <laughs> <laughs> we actually uh, we have, have another one for you, Russell, as well. Yeah. Would, would starfish be with the force or on the dark side? Well, I like to think <laughs> that you could have the top of it would be uh, with the force. Technically, even the dark side is with the force. They just use the dark side of the force. Chris, I'm sorry, I've outnerded you there with this question. <laughs> there we go. But what I, what I particularly liked is that this is kind of a family program and Annette managed to weave the phrase sea star anus into this family friendly program. So I like to think that because of this sea star anus, I'm going to go there with the dark side. There we go. And... <laughs> Hey, no, they have a whole the anal mound. I didn't make it. They have a what? Anal mound, like on the top of their shell, in that upper circle. That is, that's a heavy metal band I've definitely seen live. <laughs> so that was what Rhett wanted, so thank you for letting us know. Um, cool. Great stuff. One other question from Johnny Peck. Uh, how many species are there of sea stars? about 2000 yeah really? it's sort of, yeah and they actually don't quite know do they because they sort of keep finding um <laughs> they keep finding additional species just when they think they have a number they find another one that's yeah that's true that's true and there's loads and loads as with anything that goes into a certain depth in our ocean um half the time through deep sea trawling we're losing it before we find it so yeah. there could be an unknown number of them out there Whoa. I know they've been around for a long time because I, I have some like fossil echinoderms. So as a group, I know they've been around for absolutely ages. But mm. yeah, they're pretty awesome. Yeah. So oh, really cool. Gina, that is true. I'm not sure if this is a comment on whether or not they'd be on the light side or the dark side of the force. <laughs> 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 but they do have eye spots on the end of their arms. Actually, that's something I forgot to mention. That's how they see. They have an eye on each one of their arms. Um, that's cool. So if you cut, so if they lose an arm and have to grow it back slowly, then they lose a bit of their sight, their vision, as mm. well as an arm. But I'd, I'd also so presume that... that that vision was to help them protect that arm. Um. So it had ultimately failed anyway. <laughs> <laughs> 
Fair it enough. is incredible though how they can they can detach and then regenerate or and and be totally independent and then um you know divide into two i think it's amazing it's incredible yes yeah, it's, it's absolutely amazing and the fact that some of them do that just to reproduce anyway just as a yeah. method they're just like oh that's it i'm gonna divide into two now. <laughs> <laughs> so we've had another follow-up comment from Gina. Definitely dark side. <laughs> so I thought I'd just let people in on some real some Star Wars nerd stuff. This is happening behind the scenes of the Star Wars movie. So everyone knows this guy. This is Admiral Akbar. And he you see him in Return of the Jedi, and he says, It's a trap. And he lives on an ocean planet called Moncala with these guys called the Quarren. Now, this is how inventive George Lucas is. This this species is called the Mon Calamari. So literally, George <laughs> Lucas was eating calamari and thought, it's a bit like fish. I'll call this calamari, right? <laughs> Weirdly enough, these ones, who they share share this planet with, this, this is called Squidhead. So I, I must admit, George Lucas maybe failed a little bit there on naming the characters. <laughs> Squidward! <Squidward. laughs> there we oh, go. Brilliant. I think we're done. Right. Thank you, everyone, to what, for watching. Uh, please tune in next week. Our theme next week is Extreme Oceans. Yeah. Which is another heavy metal band. I saw them support Anal Mound. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great show, wasn't it? I heard it, you know, it was attended by absolutely hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah! <laughs> <Ain't> no mound! <laughs> right, tune in next week, guys. Thanks ever so much. Thanks and if so you've got much. any ideas for things that you'd like to see in future episodes, then do drop us a line. Yeah, please do. And remember to send us your things, crystals, yes. sea creatures, artwork, what methods you, you're doing to kind of help conserve your local area or to grow more food out of your current food. Ping it right. over. Right. Bye, everyone. See you soon. Have a lovely evening. Bye. Bye.